um, what's on the agenda today. So I guess we'll kind of look through a little bit. We'll talk about the last quiz. I think people mostly did pretty well on that. Um, but I want to point out just a couple of things to keep thinking about um, as we're going forward, because we'll, of course, be revisiting these concepts as time goes on. I talked a little bit last time about this, like, this idea of spaced repetition. So, you know, the first time you saw these concepts was maybe in the pre-calculate or the pre, um, the pre video, <laughs> the pre-class uh, videos. And maybe the second time you see them is either in like a lecture in class or in, on one of these quizzes. And then maybe we'll do a third time you see them on some sort of like later review. So they might show up on a, a later take home quiz. Um, right. So I wanted to say something really quick about um, Right, so this, this whole this whole quiz was on domains and ranges. So I guess number number one is, um, well, okay, number zero is, if you haven't looked at the the quiz grades uh, yet, try to do that uh, soonish, like today if you can, um, just while it's still fresh in your mind. As always, be sure to like go through and try to find the feedback. If I left feedback on any specific part, I think that's probably one of the most valuable things I can give you as a part of this class. You know, there's all these sort of mechanical things. They have to do through Alex and through the worksheets and stuff, um, but kind of the human component of it is like doing work, and like having somebody else reading your work and um, giving you feedback on it. So this, I think, is like one of the most important pieces of this class. So do read those. Um, and if you go through and look at the points, one thing you'll notice, this is like maybe uh, point number one, is that there were a lot of points given for this like explanation aspect of it. So like on most of the questions, I put something that said, you know, write a sentence explaining or justifying your answer. Um, and so I think there were some, it, so that it varied between questions, like it wasn't just a set number of points for explaining, it sort of depends on how important the explanation was for the question. But in most cases, the explanation was worth more than half of the points. Um, so even if you somehow got the, the mechanical part of the answer, um, like if you got a domain or a range completely wrong, if you were kind of explaining your work and your thought process and how you got to where you did, um, then you could get almost half of the points for that. And so I'm doing this kind of for two reasons. Um, one is that this semester is very different, right? You know, we don't really have exams per se. We don't, um, no, there's not a lot of sort of group work in class. Normally this, these would be big components of the class. Um, and so to sort of make up for that, I'm trying to sort of introduce more more writing into the class and sort of um, yeah trying trying to like write down an explanation to it. So you'll see more of this as we go forward. Um, and then secondly, this is like all this is also a huge part of what I think mathematics actually is. Um, you know, so sometimes you know me as like a working mathematician, there's sort of two aspects to the job. One of them is like sitting down and doing some calculation or something. Um, you know, figuring out the domain uh, or the range of a function. But then the other half of the job is like going out and giving a talk about it or explaining to your peers or, um, uh, you know, teaching a lesson about some topic. Just maths is this huge, vast, there's so many things to learn. Not everybody knows everything. So it's really important to be able to sort of like go and learn something complicated and then find some way to like synthesize what you've learned and teach other people about it or explain what you've learned. Um, so that's kind of why the emphasis is there. And I think outside of maths, this is also something that's just really a useful skill to have in sort of anything. If you're going into like any science discipline, of course, that's half of any science job is, you know, on one hand, you do the science, you work in the lab or whatever and find your results. And then you spend uh, six months to a year, something, you know, writing up a paper about it to tell your peers. Um, you know, so this is like peer reviewed research, it's the, you know, the, the center post of, uh, of that job. And of course, like if you're thinking about like business or things like this too, that's an everyday occurrence, you know, analyzing some complicated data and finding some way to simplify it um, and tell other people who are non-experts about it. Um, so if you lost a lot of points for explanations, don't worry about it too much. This is something, you know, we'll be working on as we go through the semester. Just be sure to like read the feedback and try to like incorporate it into your um, next, um, next assignments. Okay, um, want to share my screen screen really quick. I'm oh, sorry. I guess there's a obligatory cat break. Camille wants to say hi, I guess. Say hi, Camille. 
All right. She likes to help with the lectures, so <laughs> she like climbs up on the desk every five minutes here. Okay, so hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Oh, that's a little bit weird. Yeah, so my pen kind of cuts out when I share the screen. It's a little weird. Sorry, one sec. Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to say something about just how to how to think about domains and ranges coming away from from this quiz. Um, So like, I think a lot of the explanations talked about, um, uh, so there, there's a lot of, I guess, variation in the explanations for domains and ranges. I wanna kind of say something about, um, just how to think of them going forward. And then also I'm mentioning this now because um, so we'll talk about this a little bit later in the class. There's this uh, this first project coming up, right? Instead of having a first exam, we have um, this uh, sort of writing project to do. And domains and ranges will be um, an important piece of that. So I want to kind of um, set up a little bit there. Uh, so like the one, one thing we've been kind of looking at is you have some sort of function like this. There's a y, there's an x axis, and this is some function given by f of x. You know, maybe we had things where it was like deleted at points, that kind of thing. Um, and then we talked about the range or the domain and ranges and a lot of it um, was like, you know, well, we can just kind of look at the graph and we can reason about this pictorial representation of our function and sort of figure out what the domain and range is from there. And this works really, really well for the kind of work that we're doing specifically you know, in the worksheets or in Alex or something where we're given this function um, that takes in x values that are numbers and gives you, maybe this is x equals three or something, and maybe this is y equals two, and that point is like three, two. And this, this whole pictorial representation is just telling us that when I put in an x equals three, I should be getting out of y equals two. Um, same sort of deal over here. It's just telling you, if you put in these inputs x, what do you get as the output? And we can sort of reason this way. Um, but in a lot of situations, we don't necessarily have, you know, a graph of the function. Maybe it's something more complicated where we're trying to, um, like we just don't know anything about this function and we're trying to ourselves analyze it and learn about it. Um, in which case we won't have this tool of like looking at the graph available to us. And so may not be available. Or sometimes this question is flipped on its head where, you know, there are many, many different choices of uh, graph to use and we ourselves have to decide the domain and range. Um, so it's a little, little bit tricky in terms of a concept, but this, this is what's going to happen on the first project where, you know, there's sort of a lot of data you could be working with, um, but somehow you have to yourself restrict what data you want to push into your function and what kind of things you want to see coming out of it. So you may have choice is what I'm trying to say here. So you may have choices. It's like instead of some function having a domain and range, you have multiple functions and you yourself get to decide what the domain and range is. Um, so I want to kind of say, I think this, this viewpoint is somewhat uh, nice. The way we've been looking at things um, before is that we have this f and we have sort of a number line, this universe of things we can send into the function. And I guess maybe there's zero, negative infinity, infinity. And again, we're thinking of this function as a black box. You know, maybe we have a formula for it. Um, but maybe not, maybe it's something out there in the world that we just know is some function of the input. So we know it has this like uh, deterministic property that you know if I send in unique inputs um, and I get unique outputs or rather 
yeah, for, for every input I send in, I get a unique output. So one X value goes to one Y value. Um, the situation we've been kind of working in thus far is this kind of thing. So we send in, we think of these as like X values and Y values. But then we also had kind of a, you know, maybe we had functions that were sort of restricted. Like maybe if this function was given by the formula f of x equals square root of x, for example, then we had to take this universe on the left-hand side and sort of cut it down. So I have to think about deleting all of this stuff that's less than zero. And so the domain of this function, right, is just, let's see, so we can include zero. We can, well, we can't include infinity, but we can include everything sort of in between. And this thing was the domain. But it's kind of important to remember that it, it sits inside of this larger uh, universe. In this case, this function, like what are the things it could even, what, what could you potentially send into this function? What type of function is it? Well, it's something that takes in some real numbers. Um, and the domain is just saying, okay, now what real numbers does it make sense to put into this function? And in this case, we saw um, so I guess what happens here is that the all like the universe of potential outputs for this function, what is it? Well, it's all of, all of the real numbers, um, except that it doesn't actually hit all of the real numbers. Really, we find that it only hits the, the positive ones. So that's the, the range. And I just uh, mentioned this again to point out that, you know, the range too can sort of live in some bigger universe, like what are all of the um, possible outputs this function could uh, produce if we didn't know anything about the function? Well, we know without knowing anything about the function, this particular function, we know it gives you real numbers in some way. Um, but then we do some more analysis on the function and we find out, oh, well, it's not all real numbers. It's some very specific um, subset of the real numbers. And we'll call, we'll call that the, the range of the function. And so this all matches up nicely with kind of this like graph picture where like the universe of inputs is kind of going on this axis, this like x axis, right? And this universe of outputs is going on the, the vertical axis. So we can kind of recover the previous picture of like sort of reasoning about graphs. You know, maybe we somehow knew that this was the, what the function looked like. We could reason about the domain and range. But if we didn't know anything about this function, then we would kind of have to go back to the drawing board on this and sort of start asking ourselves, what does it make sense to put into the function? Where is it undefined? And what are all of the possible Y values it could actually take on? And so the, the point is here is, is to definitely think about this in terms of like inputs and outputs. And uh, one reason that this is, this is kind of nice to mention here is that, um, we, we saw that sometimes we just have a relation. So a relation is really set up in the same way as this, this function business. We again have like inputs and outputs. I think most people got this right on the quiz. Um, this relation can fail to be a function if you send in one input and now you have kind of two choices of output to do. Um, and so this is really the same, the same data as the, um, this like vertical line test. Maybe there's a vertical line on this function. Um, and we're kind of good in this situation because this vertical line only intersects the graph once. Uh, but like, what is this telling us in words? This is telling us I've like picked some X value, maybe X naught. And the line is asking, what are all of the, the Y values that could be associated to that X naught? And then intersecting it with the graph is just saying here's you know some output of the function that takes on that for that x value takes on a y value. So this is, this is worth thinking through a little bit why the vertical line test and this business about like sending in an x and getting a unique y out are really just two ways of saying the same thing. And in fact, something else to to think about too is that you well so this is the relation of the form y equals square root of x. 
Um, so this is the function of the form like this. We could also think of the a relation of the form. Um, you know, it's a good way to notate this. Maybe y squared minus x equals zero, or y squared equals x. So this is this is worth thinking about a little bit. You've usually seen this in the other sort of order that y equals x squared, and there's kind of no problem with that. The y equals x squared thing is a parabola like that. This one's y equals x squared. And this has kind of no problems with the vertical line test everywhere you go. You're just finding one point on the graph like that. But the, so if we flip this relation to y squared equals x instead, what we get is a parabola that traces out the same thing as y equals square root of x when the y's are positive, but it also has this other branch down here. And this relation fails the vertical line test because essentially what's happening here is maybe you're fixing, maybe this is x naught equals two or something. And okay, well, the y's are the, well, let's do this, sorry. Just to make our lives a little bit easier, let's make this something like y equals four, or x, x equals four. Um, and then let's do, let's see, so y equals square root of x is kind of the plus two part of that uh, when we're thinking about this, y equals square root of x. But if we're thinking about the orange relation where these you square the y value and you get the x value back, then there's this other uh, point down here, y equals negative two. And so in this relation, y squared equals x, we can think about you know, a lot of y values that square to the same x value. In this case, two and negative two both square to four. Um, and so that's kind of a problem if we want a function of like y is a function of x because it sort of fails this vertical line test. There are multiple y values um, that square to an x value. And so in some sense, what we actually do is we restrict the domain or the range of this relation by sort of deleting this entire branch to sort of force it to be a function, to force it to pass the vertical line test. And that's what y equals square root of x is. So like we have this relation, y squared equals x. It's a problem because it's not really a function. It fails the vertical line test. Um, and so we actually throw out part of the, uh, the domain of this, this relation, namely all of these like negative y values to come up with something that's actually a function. And that's just to emphasize that like, I don't know, maths isn't really like given to us. Like somehow um, you, know, you have to kind of like make decisions as you go um, to get things to be functions. I'll just say really quick, just things to remember, of course, these two functions will be showing up all the time. Um, these are functions where, so the square root of x has, you know, domain issues, um, right? Because we can't send in, we don't want to send in negative values, uh, right? So it's just saying that, you know, there's none of this, none of these negative x values can be sent into the square root function. The relation kind of doesn't live in those quadrants. Definitely want to remember that this has sort of issues when x is strictly less than zero. And so any, any negative number um, is going to cause an issue at the square root, um, but x equals zero is totally fine. And this is something to kind of remember when you're doing these checking domain range problems is like, um, you know, kind of like check the endpoints somehow. Like if we know that, um, we know that negative infinity, maybe up until zero, could cause problems, then it's worth checking um, an endpoint like that, like x equals zero. And you can just sort of do that manually by just like plugging this into the function. And then of course, the one over x business is, well, it's the same deal, but just when x equals uh, zero. And what you want to keep in mind here is that we can kind of 
now compose these in arbitrary ways. So I can put sort of a lot more stuff under the square root and I can put a lot more stuff in the denominator. And what happens here is I just have to check if that, whatever that more stuff was that I put in, it's really the same business. I just have to check if that is less than zero. I have to check if that is equal to zero. And so for these two steps, you might have to actually like go and solve some equation um, to figure out what for what x values is that true. Okay, so I want to say a quick word about math modeling and then I'll say something about the project because the project is going to be um, really closely tied to modeling. And so hopefully we remember this from our distant past of last week before the long weekend um, that we were doing these like linear models. And I like to think of modeling as some kind of like math wizardry or some, somehow like the closest we get to doing uh, something relatively magical in mathematics. Um, and what I mean by that is like a lot of times in real world situations, we'll have things that are functions of time or something like that. And modeling lets us kind of observe the data we've looked at in the past and project out into the future and somehow try to like predict what will happen uh, at some point. And not the best artist, but try to draw. This is supposed to be like a, a very happy wizard. Very excited to be doing mathematics at 8 a.m. Um, so let me let me start with like a situation. Uh, so let's say I've just like moved into, uh, you know, a house, and you know maybe I'm planning to be there for 20 or 30 years or something. So I'm going to plant a, uh, you know, a, a, like a garden or something like that. Um, and so I'm going to plant a bed of petunias or something. Okay, so that's the situation. Um, but there's kind of a problem. If, say, the average yearly temperature is, maybe I'll call this like T sub average. And what do I mean by this? I mean that somehow, you know, I go to the weatherchannel.org and I pull down data and I look at, you know, 2019 or something. And I look at all 365 days. I look at all the temperatures. I add them all up and I divide by 365 and I get some average temperature um, through the year. Um, and the problem is, is that if the average temperature is say above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, then uh, the petunias will uh, will die, right? So not a great situation. Sorry, communal break. Okay, so this is something I'm worried about. You know, maybe this year the average temperature was a uh, only 82 degrees, so I'm good. Um, but I need to know, like, is this a, a good thing to go and do? So what I do is I go to, I don't know, weatherchannel.com or something. I think about this graph where it's going to be some function of time. And now I'll call this like T average as a function of time. This is a little bit weird, right? Like now it's not an X and it's not a, an F of X or a Y or something like that. It's a T, which is just some, some variable, some input we can send into some function in this T average, which um, you know for that year calculates the average temperature of that year. So it's a little bit more abstract than the situations we've been in before, but we still know that these are functions that operate on numbers. I can send numbers in, I get numbers out, so we have at least uh, the graph to work with. And let's say 
Uh, before I do this, let's say maybe I measure it here for, let's do, uh, this is you know something like 1980, it's there. And maybe this is 2000. Maybe it didn't change too much between 2000 and 2020. Something like this. Maybe there's 2040, but okay, it's only 2020. So this, I only have data up until now. We're kind of only looking at the past. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is, let's see what numbers I actually used here. Let's do, maybe this is like, it was 70 degrees. That was the average temperature in 1980. Maybe it was 79. And maybe this was 82 something like that. So I just go out, I get all this data. Um, you know, I just plot it. I don't necessarily have a function yet to think about, but I want to sort of come up with a function. Um, and so this is, you know, we've seen at least one way to do this is like to fit a, a line to this guy. And so we find that, see, hopefully I can line this up. Okay. Oh, well. Okay, something like that. I guess this actually demonstrates something you'll run into with the project is that sometimes you'll fit a line to something and it may not fall exactly on the data points. This is kind of something to be expected because your data might not actually, you know, all lie on one line. So you can ask for the line that's kind of like closest to it. Um, okay, so what happens here? It's like, let's say I go out and I somehow fit this uh, line to these three points, and I get something that looks like, sorry, it shouldn't be y, it should be t average equals m now times t plus b. So it's kind of the same form, uh, but now the outputs are these t averages, the inputs are the t's, and I fit some line to it, and this is where like domain and range issues start becoming, uh, I know, something to think about. Like, does it make sense to plug in, um, I don't know, a time like this? Well, in this case, maybe. So this is corresponding, I guess, to like zero temperature or something like that. Um, and maybe this happened back in, well, according to the scale of our graph, you know, maybe this was like 1940 or something, who knows? So this model may not like actually be accurate outside of the, the range of our data. This is kind of a, uh, I guess you call it like extrapolation issues. Um, so now you might just like restrict your domain to say, well, uh, maybe I don't believe this function makes sense outside of say 1960 to uh, 2060 or something. So you have this function which kind of lives everywhere. The domain and range is all of R, it's just a line. Uh, but now we're kind of making this choice that we want to restrict the domain of our function, this function that we've we've come up with. Um, and we said, okay, well, it just doesn't make sense to send in points bet between our sort of before 1960 because we don't believe that this is a good model for that time period. And we, it doesn't make sense to point to plug in points after uh, 2060 because we don't believe it's going to be a good model after that. Um, so this is something that can happen. And right, the, the range is a little bit restricted too, right? Does, like, does it make sense for the average yearly temperature to be 8,000 degrees, maybe not on Earth, you know, it doesn't make sense for it to be negative 3,000 degrees. Well, it's like not physically possible. So now we need to like artificially think about like, how do we restrict the range of this too? Okay, so why do I call this wizardry? Because now I sort of know something. Um, let's say here's my 85 degree mark. Remember, this was the, the temperature I was worried about. Um, if, as soon as the average temperature goes that high, um, then right, so all, all the flowers will not uh, survive the year. And so I can kind of make a prediction about when this will happen, um, sort of based off of this model. I don't know if I can line it up. Okay. 
So I've just looked at the, the y value, this, this like 85 degrees, and I've asked myself, according to my model, when will that actually happen? Like I'm observing a pattern in the data that, you know, the temperature is going up year to year. And so now my question is like, how, how long do I have before I should worry about this? And according to this model, it's apparently not too long, right? This is like 2025 or something. So I'm not being like super accurate with the scaling here, but it's just to communicate the idea that you have some model and you can sort of extrapolate a little bit from it and sort of predict some future behavior um, based off of this model. And so, okay, that's when I, I want to start worrying is in five years. So maybe I can now make some decision um, based on this, this model. Uh, don't plant petunias. Okay, so they, they won't last five years. Maybe not a, a sound investment or something. I'm sorry, I'll leave that up for a second. So really quick, I'll pause here. Just are there any questions on um, just anything about the modeling aspect of this so far? So hopefully this uh, looks somewhat familiar based on some of the linear modeling we were doing last week. In that case, we had something that was like two points and we knew we could use things like point slope formulas and uh, what else? We had, we had a, a slope intercept formula. Um, but the important thing to remember here was that two points determined a unique line and we had some formulas to work with that. Um, and kind of the situation we'll see going forward is we'll have some sort of huge collection of points and the chances of all of these points lying on like one single line are pretty slim but we can sort of still um, make this simple line model um, work we can ask for like a best fit line all right i should say one more thing here about this and it's just the meaning of the, the slope so Right, we have this like, right, so this, this is something of the form, the output variable is like some m times slope, some slope times the input variable plus some y-intercept. In this case, it's a t-average intercept or something. So the intercept still sort of means the same thing. The b is just telling you, well, so this, this graph is, is a little bit misleading because this should maybe be like, t equals zero should be what I'm thinking of here. And then this t should be like years after 1960. It's another kind of weird situation where we have ourselves a choice of how to plot this, this data. We can just call 1960 like the zero year. Um, but we, you know, we could also call like zero AD, the zero year we could call negative 2000 BC, the zero year. So it's like, you have a lot of choices here. Um, but the, the intercept is still telling you the same thing. Whatever you call zero, it's just telling you what is the, the output value at that, that time. So there's some intercept to it. We have this like rise over one business. This is rise over run. So this is delta T average. This is a delta T. And so what is, what is this actually telling you? This is telling you that for every like t increments of time, so maybe in this case, um, well, okay, so there's kind of two ways to think about it. One is that if you had say m, right, and again, this is like delta t average over delta t. And let's say this was something like, uh, I don't know, two sevenths or something. And so this is telling you that for every Every, so every delta t, delta is like, um, it says a Greek letter, this is used in mathematics to denote a small change. So like a delta and t is like a difference in t values, like a t2 minus a t1 kind of a thing. And so this is telling you that for every change of seven years in this case, and this is telling you how much the y values change in that, that span of time. You get a change 
of sorry, so a change of two degrees plus two degrees uh, in temperature. So this is one way to, to interpret the slope, right? It's a rise over a run or a delta in the outputs over a delta in the inputs. How much do your outputs change with respect to your inputs? You can sort of play a silly game here where you move everything upstairs in the fraction and just put a one downstairs. And this is telling you now something about, so if, you're, if you ever take like a, an economics class or something, they'll call this like a marginal change. Marginal here just means that if you change your inputs by one unit, what is the change in the output? And so this is telling you something like every one year, the temperature changes by well, whatever the, the numerator is, and it's two sevenths, I guess, of a degree uh, Fahrenheit. So really, it's just the same information, just a little bit of algebra moving things around. Um, but interpreting the slope is, is a very useful piece of information here. It's telling you something about the rate of change of the, the problem you're thinking about. And just to say a quick word about um, something that's, uh, yeah, I'll say, yeah. Won't say too much about this situation, but at least point it out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll at least point it out because this is something you'll run into on the project a little bit. Um, so we've been thinking about these sort of functions where it's uh, maybe previously we had a function that was like, this kind of business where you sent in kind of one input x and you got one output y. And so something we'll sort of be thinking about now is maybe I'll think of this as like an f of an x. So we can expand this sort of definition a little bit by now asking about things where, okay, let's say it still takes some kind of f all right, so it's still some kind of f. It can still take x inputs, but maybe now it takes some other input, t. So now it's a function of two real numbers. So it's a little bit, a little bit tricky to think about. But somehow the black box takes in an x value, takes in a t value, and these are both just real numbers. And it gives you, it does some, mixes up x and t in some way that we don't know, and just outputs some measurement about those inputs, so some output y value. And so maybe a situation where this could happen is, all right, let's say we're trying to predict, uh, maybe I am a salesman and I want to predict how many pools um, I can sell, maybe this year or something like that. Like I want to go install pools in people's backyards. And I want to know like, is this a good, uh, is this a good prospect this year? Um, and maybe I expect that um, that's something like the revenue or something from this depends on two things. Maybe like before I expected it, it depends on like the average yearly temperature. Uh, let me, I wonder if I can move this down. So sorry, it uh, depends now one on the average uh, temperature and maybe two, it depends on some like demographic information of some, some kind, maybe it's population density in this case. Um, and maybe I expect that, so maybe I'll call this revenue R will depend on X and T and maybe my T will be this input and my x will be that input. Okay, so I expect now that somehow the output of this, and again, the output of this function is just some number. Maybe it's just some expected revenue from this, uh, 
from a year of sales or something. Um, but now I expect it depends on multiple inputs. And so there's sort of a lot of ways I could do this. I could try to like come up with one function. So I could have maybe like an F1 that just depends on T. And okay, this is giving some, some revenue that just depends on the temperature. Um, I could give some F2, maybe that just depends on X. Um, and this is some revenue function that only depends on this population density. Um, but somehow like these aren't enough to capture the information. Somehow I expect that the T and the X kind of mix up in some complicated way, and somehow not captured by just looking at these one variable um, functions. Um, so we'll think of this like revenue now instead of X and T kind of choices for, um, I guess maybe just like types of functions to consider. And so we'll use this, uh, this new sort of concept of having a function of two variables um, because it lets us model sort of more complicated situations or somehow take into account the two variables at once. And so, you know, maybe if we were doing this kind of like modeling with F1 of T, we would have some situation like this where it was a, you know, we could fit some, some linear model to it. We could fit some line if we had maybe some data points like this. And these are uh, T's down here. And this is like revenue. Um, so something like that. And what is the picture for this new situation? Well, this is where I'm sort of claiming we should probably move away from the um, this sort of like reasoning based off of graphs because now we have something that's like higher dimensional. And what I mean is like this, this whole thing lives in uh, two space. It lives in the, the plane. And that's just because it's like taking one input and giving you one output. So you have uh, one plus one, okay, two sort of dimensions to think about the input dimension and the output dimension. Um, but for this Rx of t business, we now have two inputs and one output. And if you add these all up, you have something that's like three-dimensional. So now it's just something that's a lot harder to, to draw and reason about. But sort of all of our algebraic techniques um, will still go through just fine. Maybe I'll just point out kind of what this looks like in case this is not something people have seen before. No, not the greatest artist, so hopefully I can try to draw something here. Um, what this ends up looking like is, uh, let's see if I can, so this is supposed to represent like a three-dimensional space or something. And so now instead of a line, what we have here is uh, a plane going through space that represents our function. It's kind of supposed to look like sort of a, a flat sheet of some sorts. Oops. So maybe something like that. So this is just like, you know, something in the shape of a piece of paper or something like that. And it just somehow sits in free space. And what happens, how do we sort of use this to, to reason about things? that maybe this is um, the x uh, coordinate, this is the y coordinate, and we have this sort of other coordinate z up here, and then this new, so this is still, I claim it's really the same thing we've been looking at. This is again just the graph of a function, but now we have sort of more variables floating around. This is r of x and t. Instead of being a line, it's this plane how you use it, well, you go out and you measure some x value, and then you go out on the, sorry, I guess we're, we're using t's instead of y's here. Sorry about that. Um, so you go out and you measure some t value. And let's see, maybe I want to consider this x value and this t value. And what happens is kind of walk along that value you find the corresponding t value. So now you're somewhere down here, like on the, 
the floor of this in the XT plane. And you just kind of go up to the, the hyperplane that's sitting above it. Sorry, the plane. So you walk out in some X and T direction. You look above you, you see some kind of like plane sitting up there. And the graph, or like what is the output of this function? Well, it's the, the Z value corresponding to the, the part of the plane that's like right above your head if you look directly up. And it's, so as you can see, this is like kind of more difficult to reason about. It's not easy to ask like, what is the domain and range of this kind of thing? Sort of the previous techniques of like, just look at the graph um, end up being more difficult. Um, so we kind of do this thing where we can kind of like break it up by like bringing the dimension down and start plotting things of like two variables at once and sort of see how things go that way. Um, and I want to, Oh yeah, I actually have a better image of this that I can probably throw in. Yeah, let me see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of, I don't know if people can see this. It's kind of the situation that's happening here. This is free space, the blue and the red are like our X and T coordinates. And this green is like the Z coordinate. And this purple plane is somehow like measuring the graph of this function R of X and T. And so you can kind of see that if you see if I can angle it just right, like if you look at it from some directions, you, you end up getting something that looks like a line on sort of one of the axes. So here, like this is a line on the red and the green axis. And if I kind of spin it around, do something like this, uh, I guess this is now a line on the green and blue axes. So somehow this is combining like two linear models into one and you get this sort of plane kind of thing as the output. Oh, sorry, somebody mentioned something in chat and I didn't see it. Draw or interpret a plane for the project. No, no, no. Yeah, you won't have to worry about that. Um, for the project, essentially, you're just going to be working with things um, algebraically. And we're actually going to do this, um, this sort of dimension reduction thing where instead of considering a plane, so we'll have a bunch of variables to work with, but we'll just sort of consider them in pairs. Um, instead of having this like function of two variables, we'll consider a lot of different functions of one variable. And so that way we can use the techniques that we have from this class. I'm just pointing this out for like, um, I don't know, mathematical edification. It's kind of a fun thing to see that, you know, these things are, they exist. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the project here. Actually, let me do a quick break here. I'll stop, does, does anybody have any questions about any of the modeling stuff just before we talk about what the project is going to entail. Okay. All right, so yeah, we should talk about the project a bit. So this is going to be due in, I guess, 20 days. You have just, um, let's see, I guess just under three weeks to do it. Um, hopefully it shouldn't be too bad. There's only sort of one new thing you'll really have to learn to do this. And I think most of it is just going to be in sort of understanding this problem, um, playing around with it a little bit, and uh, sort of writing something up. All right, so what's, what's the situation for the project? Um, the situation here is that we have some sort of um, scientific data that we're given, and I'll scroll down to it later, we're given um, this data in the form of a table. And this data is relating, let me, I actually have some notes that actually say what's specific. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the, this is a, a case study, I guess, from biology. And I guess what, what we're looking at is this interbirth interval of a certain species of baboons, so this Papio baboon species. Okay, and so the interbirth interval, I guess, is some measure of like um, how many, like how much time it takes um, uh, between births of like new new baboons in say like one. Uh, if you're following one group of these these baboons or something, you might see that like a new one is born every two years or something like that, or maybe it's one year. Um, 
And so this sort of affects, you know, all kinds of like population dynamics and sort of a very complicated ecosystem. We're trying to just pick out one aspect and study it. And that is what factors influence this interbirth interval. So what factors make it so that there's a longer interval between births and which factors make it so there's a smaller interval. And in this case, we're going to see that there are, well, so we've picked out two um, variables that we think are sort of explanatory in um, describing this, this interval. So this interval, again, is just some number. Maybe it's two years, maybe it's uh, 1.73 years, just some, some real number of time. And we are expecting that it depends on two inputs. Um, and the one input will be the, the temperature um, of, say, where the the, the group or the colony is living. And the other input will be the altitude at which they're living. Actually, let me just want to write a few things down. Let's see, I'll move this. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> Juggling windows here, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, we'll have this, this interbirth. interval and maybe we'll call it this like capital T and we're expecting this T will be some function of T and actually sorry we use different variables here so let's call it I we're expecting that it'll be some function of T and A so this is the, the interbirth interval. This T is a temperature. And this A is an altitude. So this is kind of what we expect. Um, and we want to have some idea of like what drives this process. Um, and so what we maybe observe, uh, sorry, let me switch sides here. So what we maybe observe um, from experimental data is that if I plot the interbirth interval versus the temperature, then well, we don't know what sort of function it is, but we expect that it increases as the temperature goes up. And so what's, what's the meaning here is that this, this interval between births is getting longer at higher temperatures. Um, and we expect actually that because we expect this um, because as the temperature goes down, the, wait, so hold on, let's see. Right, right, so yeah, as the temperature goes down, we expect that there's sort of less stress on the colony overall. Um, and maybe there's less competition for resources. Okay, so that's the interval as a function of temperature. And we can sort of separately consider now the interval as a function of altitude and we kind of expect the same behavior whereas the altitude as the as you go to higher and higher altitudes uh, the interval goes up uh, maybe because there's sort of less food available or maybe it's a more competitive environment or it's harder to survive because of lower oxygen levels or something so we expect some relationship like this but then also we have this other kind of relationship between the two variables themselves, the two inputs. Um, temperature as a function of altitude. And so I actually expect that as I increase my altitude, kind of don't know what the function is, but we expect that the temperature goes down. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Because you go to higher areas, you, go to, you get lower temperatures. And so we essentially, what this, this project will be doing is fitting models to sort of these, all of these combinations of variables and sort of trying to understand the relationships between them. Uh, let's see. So I've uploaded this, this PDF doc to ELC. So you'll definitely want to go through and like read the fine print on everything um, to see sort of what all the details are here. Um, but essentially it's going to be, let me go to this middle section here. So starting here at, at section four, it sort of describes the situation I've, I've just mentioned. And this 4.1 is kind of like, what are the actual details of the project? What needs to be 
in what you submit. Since the idea is you're going to write up some kind of paper um, that includes some analysis of these um, like different ways to model um, these relationships. And it's uh, giving you like a couple of very specific um, relationships to investigate. So the first one is to describe a model between the temperature and the altitude. So that's this third one here. And if you can see here, we have this table down at the uh, in the PDF. And so you're giving about you're given a bunch of interbirth intervals here in the table, and you're given some altitudes and some temperatures. And so for the first one, you're just considering like don't worry about the interbirth interval at all, kind of block that out. And we just look at the temperature and the altitude, and we try to figure out how these are related. And I'll show you in a second how we can. Uh, model these. You'll, you can use this uh, desmos.com tool to do uh, fitting of these models. So I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, but this is going to be the first thing to model is you'll plot all of this data and then you'll ask yourself, okay, of all of the, the, the functions that are in my uh, toolbox that we know of from pre-calculus, so it's not a huge amount, but we just have like things like, uh, you know, we have lines, we have things like parabolas, um, I guess from the last homework, we have cubics, you know, things that look like x cubed, um, maybe things like square root of x, things like that. And so we're just going to try to like um, um, see, experiment with fitting the data we see out in the world to some of the functions that we know of and sort of see which function best models that behavior. And so, okay, so you'll be putting these table entries uh, into a tool on Desmos and sort of fitting that, coming up with some kind of model. Um, so I guess here's what the plot of temperature and altitude looks like. So you can see it's not really quite a line, um, but maybe a line is a good uh, model for this kind of thing because it sort of looks almost linear, like it looks like it could lie on a line, uh, maybe up to like some experimental error in the measurement of the temperature or the measurement of the altitude maybe this altitude was measured to be slightly higher because, I mean, who knows, maybe the equipment was slightly off that day. And maybe this, uh, sorry, I don't know if you can see the mouse, this, uh, this dot that kind of lies off of the line here. So this could just be like an outlier for the situation. And so the, the, the data may well just be a line. Um, but you can sort of fit it and then you'll get some equation of a line and then the idea is you, you'll be discussing kind of what does this equation mean? Um, like what conclusions can you make from it? You know, it'll be something like y equals mx plus b if it's a line and you'll have some value for m. Maybe it's, uh, I guess maybe it's like negative 1.731 or something. And so the question is what, is, what does that number mean, right? In the context of this actual problem, what is that slope telling you? And what is the intercept actually telling you? Um, okay, so you'll have the altitude, this relation between the altitude and the temperature. And maybe you'll plot it as like the altitude is a function of the temperature or the temperature is a function of the altitude. So you have some choice in which one's the X and which one's the Y. So you maybe do both and explain which one is, um, like which one more closely um, captures this physical situation. Um, right, so you, you wanna like take some graphs of whatever you're modeling here and include these. Again, you're just gonna sort of write up a paper sort of explaining your, your analysis of um, each of these different parts. And it might include like the equation of the, the model you come up with um, and a graph of what that um, equation looks like. Some explanation of what the parameters mean. Again, if it's like a slope, um, like say, what does that slope mean in the context of this real problem? And some other sort of things like, okay, where is the function increasing? Where is it decreasing? Just some like analysis of this function you've come up with. Um, we haven't talked so much about this yet. This, this part is determining an objective function that should be minimized or maximized. And so what objective function means here is that we have something we want to measure. In this case, this is this interbirth interval and we expect it depends on a bunch of other variables. And this is a very common situation where we'll ask which combination of input variables maximizes or minimizes um, the output of the, the function that we care about. And maybe this tells us some interesting information about the situation. So here the objective function will be this interbirth interval and it'll be some function here again like of temperature and altitude 
but it's kind of up to you to come up with some um, some combination, some formula of T's and A's um, that somehow best measures the situation. So this this is kind of the, the tricky bit. Um, and so there's a lot of choices in what this function could be. You know, one thing could be, you know, maybe as an example, it could be uh, three, and you cube the t, and then maybe you do plus a squared minus square root of a plus uh, t at the end, or something like that. So this is probably not a good model. Probably does not capture the data. So I just sort of picked it randomly. But it's some formula that involves the input variables that gives you some output, in this case, the interval. interval. And then you'd want to like start plugging in the actual values from this table to see like if, you, if I plug in 23.4 for the, the temperature and I plug in 1127 for the altitude here, does this formula spit out something that's close to 24, like the actual observed data? Okay, um, so that's, that's kind of, that's the second piece of it. It'll be exploring these relationships, graphing the various pairs of variables like that, um, coming up with this objective function, um, and then doing some kind of fitting to it. And at the end, it'll also be, um, you know, discussing a little bit, like what's the domain and range of this function that you've come up with? Like, what does it make sense to put into this function you've, you've made up? And sort of what are all the possible outputs it could take on? And same sort of business where, where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? Maybe some kind of graph of, right? Again, this is a little bit difficult because this is some kind of very complicated thing sitting in free space, but maybe you can think about what does it look like if you set t equals to zero? Now it's just some function of a. And so you can try plotting that. And then if you set a equals to zero, now it's just some function of t. You can try plotting that separately. It's somehow just like finding some way to get a handle on this complicated um, function. Um, yeah, so let me, yeah, there's a little bit more, like this is, this section here is just um, some analysis of this i, this i function you come up with, this function of t and a. So do some, you know, graphs, um, explaining kind of the behavior of the graph, um, finding out where this like optimum altitude and temperature is that either maximizes or minimizes this interval interval. Um, maybe just, yeah, so describing a, a trend for how, how things change. So if I increase T, what happens? If I decrease T, what happens? So it'll be some like exploration of how this, how this function works. And then this, this last thing here is a little bit tricky. Determine how sensitive your approximation is um, by making a small change to the parameters. And so what this means is like if I, so I have this, this equation here, what happens if I replace this by 3.01 t cubed plus a minus square root of a plus t. So I've changed one of the, the input parameters just a tiny bit. And now I want to like send in all of my input values in, in again and ask, well, is it still giving me like approximately the right outputs for the interbirth intervals? And if I go back to this table, if I plug in say 23.4, and 1127 from this first row into this new equation with 3.01, do I still get something that's close to this 24 output from the first row? Okay, so that's yes, so that's the, the crux of the project. I want to say a little bit about how to actually do this, this modeling part of it. And again, I would I would really recommend, so I posted this up on ELC, so definitely go and like read through read through all of the different sections, um, try to make sure you have like a good um, understanding of what the project is asking, um, bring any questions you have about um, requirements or anything for the project to the next class, um, but definitely try to like read through it in detail. Um, we'll do some sort of, um, we'll make it sort of a group project. I think what I'll do is, is pair people up um, through ELC so the idea is you'll be working in groups of two. You can sort of meet outside of classes to sort of work on the project, collaborate on it, and 
uh, two groups of up to two or three, and you'll be able to um, submit it as a group. Okay, so I'm gonna say something about how we actually do this um, sort of fitting business. So this is, if you guys haven't been here before, this is desmos.com. And this is a good place to just sort of explore um, different functions, plug them in and play with parameters. Um, and so if you just go to desmos.com and I don't even think you have to sign in. But the idea here is this thing on the left is like a function. Um, you can sort of input um, some specification of a function. So there's f of x equals x squared. Um, maybe there's x squared plus two, shift it up. Minus two, you can shift it down. So you can kind of play with this sort of stuff. You can let things be variables, which is really nice. So if I just do, um, let's do plus c, for example. And I'll add a slider for c. And so this, tell, you know, this lets you sort of change the value of c. So here it's c equals one, and there's c equals you know, negative one or something like that. So you can see how your function changes as you swing these parameters around. So this is really good too, as if you're trying to understand these like shifts. So maybe I'll do x plus c squared. Now I can see how these shifts go. I can add in a second parameter d, and I can change that one too. So the c parameter is the, the horizontal thing. The d parameter now is doing the vertical uh, shifts. Um, and so this is a good way just to like plug in, you know, put in some functions and then just see what they look like and how they behave as you change these parameters. And this one, um, if you want to plot data, there's this table thing. You go to the plus, you bring up a table, you can put in X values and Y values and it will plot them on the graph. So here's two and four, I did one, one, two, four, three, nine, something like that. So you can plot a bunch of values and then you can also plot a function and maybe this is x squared. Oh, geez, funny how that worked out, right? So this, this function exactly matches my data. But okay, what if there's some experimental error? Let's see, 4.9, uh, 0 0.5, 11.3. Okay, so now my things don't exactly fall on that parabola, but maybe I can sort of play with a function to give one that closely matches it. So okay, maybe maybe something like that seems like a good fit. Maybe not. There's one that sort of goes through exactly one point. Uh, maybe I want one that goes through the bottom point instead. So you can kind of mess around with this um, to get an actual function. Uh, one thing you can do and this will be probably the most important piece of it, is you can do something called regression on your function. And so what this does is you specify some general form of a function. So some way the y's are expressed in terms of x's, and it will find the best, um, the best function of that form that fits your data. So let me explain what I mean here. The way you do it is you do y1, and so that's referencing the y values in this column here. Do this little like tilde twiddle uh, thing. And let's say we expected it landed on a line. So let's do m as a parameter. And the input variables are the x ones. So these are the things in the, the column on the left. And so we're doing like y equals mx plus b. And so what this is doing is it's finding the best fit line to your data. So we have three data points and it's finding the line that somehow is uh, the best line that's close to all three points simultaneously. And so it'll be up to you to determine what is this, what does this R squared thing mean? Here it's telling you the, the parameters are 5.4. What does the slope of 5.4 mean in this context? What does this intercept of negative 5.233 actually mean? Um, but I'll also say that you don't have to use just lines. You can do something like y equals x1 squared. Uh, plus, I don't know, m times x. 
Does that actually work? Okay, so you can do something like this. So here right now, I'm, instead of doing a line, I'm hoping that it's maybe something of this form, y equals mx squared plus b. All right, so instead of just a line, it's some parabola or something. And we see that we actually get a function that seems to be a pretty good fit. Like it almost passes through all three data points. Uh, but now it's a question of like, what does this m mean now? Like it's definitely not a slope because we don't have a line. Uh, what does this b mean now? It's not so clear. Um, so that's how you do the modeling. The idea is right there is this table in the actual project. So you want to put that data from the table in here and then experiment with like different types of functions to put on the right hand side here to see what kind of gives you just visually looking at it, what is a good fit. You can also look at this R squared statistic if you want to read up on it a little bit. It's also some measure of how good the fit is. Uh, okay, so I'll leave it at that. Again, be sure maybe before Thursday to go ahead and look through um, just the full, all of the, the sections of the project, read through all of the, the fine print there. And then on Thursday, just bring any questions you have about that. And I will probably assign the groups here within a, um, maybe within a day or two. So you should be getting some notification of who you're paired with pretty soon. All right, thank you all. Bye, thank you. Yep, see ya.